From Cali to Tally, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source, and this is Wake Up Warchant. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! Welcome on into the program. I'm Aslan. He's Corey Clark. You already know that. It's Wake Up War Chant. Thanks so much for being here. Over the hump. Short week. Uh, so much to still talk about, Core, but we're running out of time. But before we get to that, how are you? I'm good, buddy. I'm good. How are you? Dude, man, this is... Um, it's weird, the whole being up to like 4 in the morning after the game, and then Tuesday, kind of using it as a recuperative day, back on the grind Wednesday, back on the grind today. I just got to kind of get my bearings. It's, the season is it's, it's coming at us fast, and I'm, just, I'm not mentally prepared, but I think I'm a little bit better today than I was the day before, and that's all we can ask for, right? Just getting better one day at a time. And these Monday games always kind of throw everything out of the wha- out of whack anyway. Like, it's crazy that essentially two days from now there's a football game. Nuts. Crazy. Uh, it's, it's, it's just it feels like yesterday the game was played. It, uh, it almost essentially was. I mean, it's just it's weird when you only have five days in between games. For sure. Let's not talk about Virginia Tech. You want to? Is that game? Is then the rear view for us? Have we scrapped it? Have we twenty four hour ruled it on the program now, Corey? Here's what I'd like to address, though, only because I was the one that asked the question. I asked the question of, to Willie Taggart about how it affected his offense every time they would have a big chunk play to have a Virginia Tech player go down. I didn't say, "Hey, Willie, do you think they were faking injuries?" Um, they were, but I didn't ask him that, and he didn't agree to that. But, of, of course, he admitted and said, yeah, that affects you when when you're trying to go up tempo and get in a rhythm and you have to take a four-minute timeout because, again, it wasn't just that a guy fell down with cramps, quote-unquote, or whatever it was. It was that they would go to a TV timeout. And then somehow, because it's the media, it's college football media, it's the world we live in, I'm a part of it. I guess I can't criticize. Um, and I'm sure if I was a Virginia Tech reporter, I might – say something i i don't know but you know all of a sudden it becomes a story that taggart's blaming virginia tech for the loss or you know people in the national media including espn are saying man just shut up and coach don't worry about essentially i'm paraphrasing uh, don't, don't blame them for uh for faking injuries don't don't make excuses for how poorly your team played and he didn't make an excuse but nobody could watch that footage and that game and think that that was all a coincidence that's all it doesn't, and there's no rule against what they did. And Taggart didn't say, "Yeah, it was it was bush league." He didn't say anything like that. But we all saw it. We're all brain. We all have brains. We know what they were doing. It's fine that they did it because it's within the rules, I guess. But he was asked if there's anything the NCAA could do, and he's like, "Well, maybe they'll police it over time. They always eventually come out with a way to do these things, and maybe they'll take care of Florida State at some point, or our teams like Florida State that run up tempo." But it, it, it just it, it bothers me how it became a um, an issue with Willie Taggart seemingly blaming something for the loss when he never did that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just never thought it was that big of a deal. It was unfortunate. I mean, it, it did put a damper on a couple situations, but I don't think it ultimately cost them the football game. And I don't think, it again, didn't. I don't think Willie said that either, but there's that natural tendency of, well, if he did say it wasn't a problem, so well, maybe it did cost them the game. And it's like, nah, this. You know, and it's best, I don't know how much of it's difficult too, because when your mantra is blame no one, make no excuses, do something, and then you're like, well, actually, no, I did notice that too, Mr. Clark. Thanks for asking that. Actually, yeah, it was a little bit weird. That I guess maybe that makes it a little more hypersensitive to to being open to criticism. But saying, well, sure, I guess, man. But saying blame no one and make no excuses, he didn't blame. You know, he didn't say, yeah, uh, Fuente and Foster. I hope they sleep at night. They're the reason we lost. Their their shenanigans are the reason we lost this game. Right. He, he didn't. He didn't. There weren't excuses, and he didn't blame anyone except for his players and himself. Um, but the, you can point out something that happens in a football game that's a detriment to your team. In, it, it doesn't mean that you're you're uh, making excuses and that that's the reason you lost. He, you know, he could have brought up a block punt, a kid getting the punter getting tackled in the end zone and that not being called, or the fact that his kid scored a touchdown. In the, the for some reason, the review booth didn't review it, didn't buzz down to review it. He didn't do any of that. He was asked a question, and I guess what the media wants people to do is when they're asked a question to just say, "I'm not going to comment on that." And then how would that have looked? Yeah. If I said, Willie, what did you think of the Virginia Tech players? How did that affect your offense when they would fall down behind the scenes? 
uh, behind the play, and they would go to a TV timeout, and it would take four minutes to run another play. If he said, Corey, I just I don't want to comment on that, then that's a comment in itself. That means that, yeah, he's saying that they faked an injury. And then after that, you have to ask, well, why don't you want to comment on that? It's just sometimes these guys, and I'm certainly not protecting Willie by any stretch, but sometimes these coaches are just put in – uh, no win situations. And I think it's different. I don't know if you remember in 14 when Dave Doran accused Florida State of doing it. I um, saw it in the story from Andrew Adelson, but I, I vaguely remember the 14 game. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I vaguely remember it too, and I ripped Doran for that. Number one, because come on, man, you haven't won. I had won at that point. I had won as many ACC games as he had, and he's gonna he's gonna rip. He's gonna he's gonna uh, accuse Florida State of. Cheating the defending national the, champs, the defending national champs of, of of something like that. And meanwhile, I I believe at least one or two of the guys that actually came out of the game missed the next week uh, with injury. They didn't come back in the game. These guys were literally coming back in the game two or three plays later. I it, you know, and it's fine. It, it's it's within the rules. But I I just thought that was a, that was different than. These guys, you know, there's the one clip that I tweeted about that's been all over social media where the dude literally looks, he's jogging down the field because the play had just been made. He's trying to line up. He looks down, he looks over to his sideline and then falls down. Trainers come out, they go to a TV timeout. It's just, that's not a coincidence. But it's all right. They did what they did, but man, don't, I just, what's Willie supposed to say? Yeah. He said, he said, look, it's part of the game. We have to deal with it. He didn't say that's Bush League and they should be a, they should be ashamed of themselves. I don't want to win a football game that way if they can sleep at night. So that was just that's just frustrating that like what the, what's the guy supposed to say? You know, I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this. I just wish there was at some point that listen, everybody watches the game from home now. No one comes to the stadiums anymore. It's a little bit of hyperbole. But why is there not somebody who has access to the TV feed at all times in the replay booth? Or the replay booth, rather than the replay booth, the replay booth. <laughs> replay. <Yeah. laughs> that, that did not see that. I mean, literally saw a guy trotting up the field, looking at the play, looking at a sideline. Then, oh, my, my turn. Okay, let me go down. Like, how does somebody not see that? You get flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct, and then if you get another one of those, you get automatically ejected. Because is that how it works with unsportsmanlike conduct? If you get one, if you get a second, you get ejected from the game. So, I mean, there's got to be something that all the video that we're seeing at home. That there's somebody that sees that as well, and then that's I know it's a judgment call, but come on, that's that's as plain as day to anybody that somebody's kind of you know tanking it, if you will. But but yeah, ultimately, I, I mean, it's it's a tough situation, like you said. Willie really can't say anything in that uh, situation and not come off either sound like a poor sport or uh, just having some sort of axe to grind. But such is the world what's, we live in. But what's going to happen? What is going to be unfortunate moving forward is there will be injuries this year, like legitimate injuries at Dope Campbell Stadium for a for an opposing defender. Maybe they snap an ankle, and no matter what, they're going to get booed yeah. because that's just how it's going to be from now on. This was such a it was so in my it was so um, egregious. I, I don't know egregious right away right off the bat that Florida State fans are just going to be completely sensitive to it and it, it's going to be kind of an ugly scene where where Florida State fans are going to be booing kids that are actually injured but you know they're also going to be booing kids that are fake injuries because that's that apparently is is uh, how it's going to how it's going to work I don't know weird yeah. it's just weird I, I just it, it doesn't really need to be a talking point Florida State got beat badly there, nobody's saying otherwise. Did that hurt Florida State's chances of moving the ball? Sure, I guess, yeah. But there, there's no – just because it, uh, you can still run a good first down play even if the team gets set up. You know, that's not on Florida. That's not on Virginia Tech. If they want to take their defensive tackle out for a play, th that doesn't mean that your drive is over, that you have no chance of scoring. Um, it does It does hurt what you try to do, but you have to adjust to that. And I, I kind of thought Willie said that. All right. We talked anyway, way too much yeah, about yeah, that. I really don't want to yeah, go nine well, minutes into it. We just did nine minutes about it. That's what we do, buddy. What else are we going to talk about? The punting? No, let's talk about practice. We got ten minutes on Wednesday to view <laughs> right. it. You were uh, dutifully and diligently cranking out some content for the loyal subscribers of WarChant.com. Don't forget, folks, use your uh, WarChant30 promo code for 30 free days if you're not part of the family. And uh, life will probably start changing in, in numerous ways for the positive in your life if you do join WarChant.com on a full-time basis. But 
I, I, not a lot to sort of, uh, you know, observe, if you will, just because it was less than about 10 minutes, I feel like. DeKalen Brooks, Jaden Woodby were both out there. Both were in blue non-contact jerseys. But I did actually see DeKalen Brooks go through the, the tackling drill. They roll out that little donut, and you, you wrap up on it. Did see DeKalen participate in that. Did not see Stanford Samuels go after it, although he wasn't in a blue non-contact jersey. Meanwhile, uh, Jaden Woodby did not uh, go through that, and, at least, in, again, in, in the eight minutes or so we were out there. So just take that for what it's worth. Offensive line, I pointed this out to Ira. I don't know if he actually – I don't think he posted it because maybe he thinks I was totally wrong, which is fine. But this is our program, course, so I can talk about stuff because Five Star doesn't have veto authority on the show all the time. But I did notice offensive line, it, it seemed to me Derek Kelly was working at tackle. Again, this is all brief eight-minute window we have, but there was off to the side, there was the GA. I don't even know who the grad assistant is or the offensive line assistant, but he was working with interior guys. You saw Everly snapping the ball. And look, like he had Arthur Williams flanked to one side of him, and then Everly was snapping the ball. So I would assume that's sort of like your, your quasi-first team unit. But over on the side with Greg Fry, he had Abdul Bello, Jawan Williams, and Derek Kelly working kind of like on an island and going from one level to the next working on blocking. So it, to me, that sort of seemed like, are these are my tackles because Landon Dickerson with that ankle injury we, it, and you know Willie was kind of vague about it, but at the same time, a little bit insightful, made it seem like Landon Dickerson is probably not coming back immediately. So Abdul Bello is a guy that's been working solely at tackle. Same thing with Jawan Williams, and Derek Kelly actually has experience working at tackle. So to me, it seemed like maybe those are those are his three guys he's going to have to use at tackle. So I'm kind of interested to see how that looks. And if Cole Minshew does come back, and then, I don't know, maybe you go Arthur Williams over Mike Arnold and Everly. You have a pretty much a rebuilt offensive line going against a completely different caliber of an opponent, but at least they're not standing pat and just you know plugging one guy in at one position that got hurt and he's shuffling guys around and trying to find a combination so that to me that was a little bit uh, encouraging yeah yeah i guess so uh, you know you wonder if you don't agree you don't have to agree core you go shoot it down do, no do i mean I, I it's good that i mean you don't want to just you know um just go down with the ship uh and just say whatever we're going to ride with these guys but you know it also seems like you're kind of rearranging deck chairs on the titanic like what? What can you do? And I guess the more and that was just you know I was going down with the ship metaphor. That's why I went with the Titanic. I got but, you. Um, but uh, <laughs> more than anything, it's like man, well, what what did you see in August that after one game you pivot so much? What like what didn't? Well, you, people got hurt. They, they, I mean, Dickerson's but, hurt. Yeah, yeah, you're right. With Dickerson being hurt, I was going to say you don't want to see enormous changes, but I guess injuries can dictate that. You would you would hope that uh, you know because it seemed like Jawan Williams essentially got fired after three series, like we can't play this guy at right tackle now. He had to come back in because Dickerson got hurt, but they obviously weren't happy with Jawan Williams. It didn't seem like um, in the first half because he got replaced. Was it that quick? But was it really I'm like almost, three series? I, I'm almost positive it was the second quarter. Yeah. Um, when when uh, uh, no, that sounds right. Blake, no, you're right. Blake, you're right. You're right. Uh, I mean, that's Blake just crazy, right? We're replace him. Yeah, Abdul Bello came in. Yeah, yeah. And and listen, um, again, Abdul Bello is a guy that we've I mean, I've seen go through several drills and did not really look to be some sort of, you know, revelation in the, in the making. I mean, adequate maybe. So to to see him kind of come in that situation was bizarre and then to see Williams go back out there that that really kind of caught me off uh, guard. But I think maybe you know, Fry realizes that he's going to have to put somebody like Derek Kelly out there cuz he needs two at least decent uh, offensive tackles, and maybe he only has one right now. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing: like, I know we're we're very um, very down on the offensive line. I know Florida State fans are too, and with good reason. Not only what we saw Monday night, but just what we've seen the last few years. It's been pretty pretty tough to watch. Um, but there is a chance these guys get better. I mean, you do improve over the course of a season, theoretically. That is what's supposed to happen. People get better. They get more experience. They they become more confident. Or they lose all confidence and spiral into a uh, oblivion, but I or into a pit like that can happen too. But I think you theoretically, mean uh, yeah, theoretically they can get better. They should get better. Right. So maybe what we see in the middle of October is a different group than what we saw on Monday night because on Monday night at times, obviously, they looked overwhelmed. Well, you know, and I know this is going way back, but I remember Rodney Hudson's first game. Uh, he started as a true freshman at Clemson in Jimbo and Trickett's first game in 2007. And I know we're going back 11 years now, but I remember that game specifically because Trickett looked like he was about to lose his mind on Rodney Hudson. 
uh, multiple times. Like, what is going on? Who? What is going on? I think he might have benched him because he's a true freshman and he just was getting uh, uh, abused. Well, you know, later that year, Rodney Hudson was a freshman All-American. He turned out to be probably one of Trickett's best linemen that he had at Florida State. He was a great college football player. He turned out to be. And he was, he was good by the end of that year. So people do improve. I'm not saying there's any Rodney Hudsons on this team, but let's see what they look like. If it still looks like in the looks like this in the middle of October, then what what can they do? You know, Greg Fry's a good coach. I think he has. It, it, maybe he was left with more than we think, and it just looked really awful on Monday night. And maybe there actually is more talent there than we think, and it just needs some experience and some confidence. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how sincere do you think Willie was when he semi walked back his assessment of the offensive line. You know, Saturday or Monday night after the game, he was kind of that was the first thing he jumped on was that the offensive line did not seem to win one on one battles. But then on Wednesday, when we spoke to him, he said, actually, you know, it, it didn't seem as bad as I initially thought. I mean, do you think that's just him kind of, you know, doing some d damage control for their psyche? Or do you think he really maybe looked at the tables like, actually, maybe it wasn't that bad after all? Yeah, I really don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe a little bit of both. I mean, it certainly wouldn't do him or his team any good to be like actually it was worse i i knew they played pretty bad on monday night but i when, when i looked at the film i had to cut it off or i just watched between my fingers because it was gross i can't watch that anymore like that doesn't do any good for anyone so i i do think that those guys need to build, be built up with some confidence i mean they just do i mean we always talk about quarterbacks and and cornerbacks and all these other positions pitchers in sports that need confidence shooters well, you, offensive linemen need it too, and and if you don't you don't want to as a head coach, you can't just consistently lament how bad your offensive line played. So I, even if he doesn't believe it, it makes sense to go out and you know build them up a little bit because they Lord knows they need it after what what we saw on Monday night. Yeah, somebody commented on the on the forums from the yesterday's show and was like, Aslan, it surely you you might mean that they were just a C minus when it comes to pass pro overall at least run blocking they were an f it, it just comes back to the thing that i, I you know you hear the whole thing about well, offensive line all five guys got to do their job if one guy doesn't do their job the whole thing goes by the wayside out of 80 snaps in a college football game how many times you all five guys ace their job you know it just it never happens somebody's got to step up in those situations and make a play whether it's a quarterback climbing the pocket whether it's a receiver breaking off a route whether it's a running back doing something amazing like cam Akers and busting things around the corner so i mean i i know maybe i have the bar set so low just because the way florida state's offensive line has looked but also the, the whole i mean i guess they never got into tempo enough but the whole like one of the biggest advantages of going tempo is not so much keeping the defense off their on their heels it's like your offensive line doesn't really have to be as sound it's like just get off the ball, get in somebody's way. We're going to get the ball out of the quarterback's hand in less than two seconds, and we're going to be all right. So you know, I don't know if it's, this is ever going to be an offensive line that's just mauling people, pancaking people, just you know, shutting guys down when they're, when they're pinning their ears back. I just feel like it's good enough to, to win enough games to, to make this a, a successful season, but we'll see how it all shakes out. They've, they've got uh, 11 more games, hopefully 12, uh, to figure it out. Hey, let's step aside, Corey, for a break. We're going to do Renegade Express. It's a short week, but we got a whole bunch of questions. We'll start tackling them right after this. You're listening to Wake Up War Chant, all Knowles, every day. Now back to Corey and Aslan. He's Corey Clark, senior writer and columnist for Warchant.com. I'm Aslan Hajavandi, director of digital media for aforementioned website. Let's make up Warchant. Thanks for being here, folks. We appreciate it. We're going to get to your questions. We might even get to some of the phone calls today as well. Uh, but before we get to that, just a reminder, folks, that uh, subscribers get a 10% discount on all purchases at Garnet and Gold, both in store and online. So when you do get all the great information from Gene and, and Ira and Corey and Michael Langston, uh, you also get a nice 10% off at uh, Garnet and Gold, so you can get some Garnet stuff after you bought all your black stuff for the uh, for the blackout. Speaking of Michael Langston, I think actually he and I are supposed to do some sort of recruiting chat later today. Be on the lookout for that. It's going to be a video chat. You get to see Michael uh, look at you in the eye through a camera and answer your, your deep probing questions about recruiting. I know you're psyched for that, Corey. You're a big recruit, Nick. You know I'll be on that. You know I'll be on the site for that. I, I'd love to be there with you guys if I could be. You know that. All right, in spirit, in spirit as always, right? Let's get to the not questions. In, not in the restaurant spirit. 
Ah, uh, you mean you mean in spirit? Yes, way, I got you. Way to work that in there. Good job, <laughs> man. Always on the hustle. All right, let's get to the questions. This comes from the Tribal Council. Noel Halla, five messages. This is fifth message. He joined in January 2018. What up, Noel Halla? What's up, guys? I was just as disappointed as everyone else that watched that debacle Monday night. What really bothered me the most was what I saw or did not see on the offensive side of the ball. Why didn't Willie call any screen pass plays to try and slow down the blitzing, aggressive defense Virginia Tech was playing? Also, is Wake Up Orchant going to take two days off after every loss? That will really suck. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I don't uh, know where that came we're from. Not, yeah, we're not yeah. planning on that. We, no. were, we were here the last two days, man. We were in the press box on, uh, well, early Tuesday morning uh, talking about that debacle. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we'll be recording some sort of instant analysis thing, I would imagine. Maybe not a full. Oh, I blowing. see what he's saying. I see what he's saying because most games are on Saturday. So yeah, we maybe. wouldn't have a, we wouldn't have a show on Sunday, but we would on Monday. So you know, one day off. Right. Um. Actually, I don't know, Corey. I think we do have to record something on Saturdays after the game, or maybe just Gene and I'll do. We'll give you a break since you're going to be working on some columns and things like that. But yeah, we'll we'll have something. Uh, and why do you got to be negative, Noel Hollow? Why do you got to say we're going to take two days off after every loss? Why can't it be after every win? We expect we're going to lose every game? Come on. There, there's a decent chance we've already seen the last loss of the season for Florida State. Yeah, come on. Ohio Guys, State 2014, you, the precedent's been set. Understand something, and this is 100% truthful. If Florida State doesn't lose again, they're playing for the national championship. This one loss isn't the end of the season. Now, I know you might say, well, Corey, don't you have to score touchdowns to win games and not lose games and, and, and you know show up in rankings? Sure you do. I got gotcha. you. But as we sit right now, even unranked, just know that if Florida State somehow, some way, wins the next 11 games on its schedule, baby, we're going to be in Charlotte for the mm, ACC championship game, right. probably against Virginia Tech. That's right. Get a little revenge on them because we're. I think Florida State will actually intentionally hurt some of their guys this time, and then uh, that's a joke. And then uh, beat Virginia Tech, and then go play who Alabama in the uh, in the one of the semifinals games. We Tua has no chance. Bama. And then you play. Uh, we want Bama. I don't even know who would beat it. Wisconsin. Who who the heck knows in the whoever in the whoever wants game. some doesn't whoever matter. Some. Won't matter because Florida State will be riding high on a twelve game. 13 game winning streak at that point. So they'll it's not over, team. folks. Yeah, they'll it's be the hottest team. Over. They'll be the hottest team in the nation because Alabama will lose some weird game in November, and the stat will be Florida State has got the longest active winning streak in the nation. So uh, don't give up on us. <laughs> to your question, though, Noel Halla, uh, you know, I asked Willie after the game in terms of the amount of guys they brought in the box if that was what made things difficult, and he said they really didn't. Uh, so. I mean, why didn't throw more screen passes? I mean, I, th I thought I feel like we saw enough screens. It just wasn't your traditional running back coming out the backfield like a wheel route sort of thing. It was that wide receiver horizontal stuff. But I mean, maybe in terms of like a quick slant, I don't know. I mean, maybe because I know they, it felt like they crowded the line of scrimmage. But to what Willie said, they really weren't bringing in more than you know six or seven into the box. I don't know if that was what bothered me the most, but if that's what bothered you, Noel Hall. I, I don't know. Well, maybe we'll see from Willie in the in the future. <laughs> Uh, you, they could run more effective screen passes. The stuff they ran on uh, on Monday, did any of them work? Like, I know LeBourne had a – was that – I don't even know if that was really technically a screen pass. But the stuff out wide to Patrick and McKinney, it just, again, it seems like you have so many different kinds of athletes on this team that would be better suited for taking those horizontal passes and trying to make some people miss than, uh, than your 230-pound running back and your 250-pound tight end. Yeah. Uh, next question comes from Tennis Ump. He's a legitimate ump for tennis. He's been doing uh, all sorts of grand slams, but I think he's retired. But anyhow, thanks for joining the program. He says, thanks, guys, for the show every morning. When I saw the dancing pre-kickoff, I had a flashback and hoped it wouldn't turn out like Seminole Rap did, but unfortunately it also backfired. Would like to know why after LeBorn was so dynamic on that one pass play, we did not see more, and I think all of us were expecting more slants to our slot receivers, so why was that not a bigger part of our game plan. Thanks. Yeah, I, that's there's really no good answer to that. The question was broached. Uh, hey, coach, to, to both Walt Bell and Willie Taggart, Kalen LeBourne looked really good in that one snap. Where'd he go? Or maybe it wasn't phrased like that, but is there a, a conscious effort going to be made to get him the ball? And both quickly said, yep, yep. So I I don't know. I mean, LeBourne was like seated on like the trainer's table at one point, just kind of in no man's land by himself. Like, hey, we're... 
or is this is this happening all over again? Like I'm, I'm not going to be able to see the field. It was a bit awkward or I don't know odd to see a guy who had the most explosive play of the entire game. Maybe not yardage, but just in terms of holy cow, that guy's on this side. Not see another play of consequence after that. Yeah, I mean that's a rightful criticism. And again, it's one game, so we'll see what what we're saying in the middle of the season. But it boggles the mind that uh, Terry was only thrown to twice, even after that great catch he made over two dudes. And that LeBourne, who had an electrifying run, man, that was incredible. I know it was a reception, but it was a catch and run, um, that he never got the ball again. I mean, the the strength of Willie Taggart's offense is supposed to be to get your playmakers the ball, get them in space, and let, them, let their natural ability take over. Well, that didn't much happen, did it? I mean, again, it, it makes no sense. I think Patrick and uh, McKinney both led the team in catches with five each. And I just wouldn't think – and Jock Patrick, again, people that listen to this show know how I feel about that dude. He is a good college football player, and I think he will play in the league. He is a good running back. Um, probably a little slept, – slept on more than he should be by the FSU fan base. He is a good football player. But he's not the guy – He's if, out of all the running backs you have, why is he the one that's catching all the balls in the flat? Why that guy? That, that just doesn't seem to make sense. And the same thing with, like, McK- you have DJ Matthews and Nooney Murray and – and Harrison and Keyshawn Helton we heard about all and he was on the field but he we heard about how great he was all these guys that are so shifty and quick and elusive they're the ones that are trying to block while McKitty and Patrick get five catches each out in the flat I don't know I, I think again that's something that needs to be figured out it's a long season and you, you have to assume and hope that the guy getting paid five million dollars a year figures that out quickly and devises a way to get his best players and his best playmakers the ball I just the running back position is, is the hot hand is the most it's the most obvious go to the hot hand situation when Kalen Labore busts that out I remember thinking to myself I'm like uh oh I'm like well there goes Cam Akers for the rest of the night we're not going to see him and then sure enough I mean and I'm not and I'm not blaming anything on Cam it just you felt like all right maybe they figured that they get some sort of spark out of Kalen but to not use him at any point moving forward I, I don't know I just don't know how you get to that point I mean are you just are you looking at your play sheet and you're just a certain you know personnel groups that he's not including but you like those plays and you you're just you're you're too absent-minded to realize that he's not in those personnel packages it was that was bizarre as for more slant passes i don't know maybe we'll, maybe we'll uh get to ask them that uh, later in the week i don't know if maybe that's a big part of their offense or not but you would just think yeah like trey mckitty you like throwing so many passes his direction and if you're not going to use him on the seam why not get him in the middle of the field where he's big and can probably pinball off a couple guys same thing with tamori and terry um, I don't know. We'll find these things out. It's only, Again, it's one game. Hopefully we'll get better. We'll come right back after this, taking more of your questions on the Renegade Express. It's Wake Up War Chant. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. Warchant.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source. He's Corey Maslon. It's Wake Up War Chant. Welcome back to the program. Maybe you lost some of the wind in your sails to go on a big time Florida State away game trip, but folks, don't. Get your motivation back. This will help. Game Day Excursions are offering packages for the Florida State Notre Dame game. Main package that you guys want to get into is probably the, the whole trip that's going to take you from Chicago to South Bend, and it's a tailgate. Uh, check it out. GameDayExcursions.com. Use the code WARCHANT to get $10 off. If you're a subscriber, you can use the tailgate only option. Otherwise, if you're just a common person, which is fine, not all of us can be special, uh, you have to get the entire trip, the bus trip from Chicago to South Bend and back and the tailgate party package. That'll be a fun trip. A bunch of my friends, though, I don't know how how much they're still on board with it. It's tough to go to the the wives and ask them for another week off um, and and, and want to die on that hill, Corey, after you, you came to Tallahassee on Labor Day Monday and saw that. But you know, I, you know, again, I think yeah. we talked about it after the game. But how bad must the people felt? Like it, we got to go to our houses after that game. I know yeah. it was late, but people that had to get up the next morning, like seven in the morning, go to the airport to New Hampshire, or you know, we met we met a guy from Thailand. 
another uh, couple from Germany Stuttgart. that came to this game. Corpus yeah. Christi. Um, just even, you know, South Florida. That's a long drive. So to come all the way up and see three points, I can understand why people might have been a little upset. It's all right though. They'll be they'll be stoked. They'll be whatever nine and one or eight and one, whatever going to that Notre Dame game, and all will be well in the world. Speaking of world, one world underscore chop and chant sends us this question, Corey. Coming into the season, I knew our offensive line was going to have serious issues. We were still learning new systems with young guys and a lack of depth at the linebacker position. But what in the world is going on with special teams? Logan Tyler had one good punt out of ten, a blocked punt by the farthest inside man. And then Ricky misses an NFL extra point. Then there's a punt return plan that had zero block attempts or return attempts. With all that talent, we should be making at least one exciting play on special teams that swings momentum. Thanks again, guys. Keep up the good work. Yeah, man. You know, I don't know what – and I'm not saying they're coached well. They were certainly were not coached well on Monday night. But I don't know what you can do about a punter that can't consistently punt and a place kicker that misses 32-yard field goals. I mean, that's not coaching – I don't know what to do about Logan Tyler, but he is a – he was a um, – I, I, he was a hindrance in that game. You know, he, they and they didn't score, but, you know, the play where he got knocked down in the end zone it probably, and it should have been a roughing the punter, but it wasn't. Yeah. Man, that was the – that was a line drive right at that kid where he caught it on a dead run in the middle of the field. There is just zero chance that that is where he was supposed to punt the ball. And, in fact, I think – Earlier in that half, maybe in the fourth quarter, he had a punt. I think it was in the fourth quarter. He had a punt where the kid bobbled it, actually. But it might have been his worst punt of the night. It was. It, I mean, he's kicking line drives right down the middle of the field. And if you know anything about football or punting, you know you want you want hang time and you want it to be angled towards the sideline so the sideline is another defender. Man, he just kicks it right down the middle of the field every time, almost every time. I shouldn't say every time. In, the, in their line drives, there's zero hang time. So that coverage team has very little chance to succeed. And he's been doing it now for three years. And I don't understand the deal. And we've talked about it in August when we saw him punt in August. Sometimes he'll kick one to the moon, and the next one he kicks one behind himself. It's just odd. But it's, you know, it's a, it's not good. And they, I don't know if they want to tell him to start punting it out of bounds, but uh, he's a detriment to the football team right now. Um, doesn't mean he's not a good kid. Heck, his, some of his teammates think he could be president one day. I, I'm certain he's a great kid, yeah. but he's not a good punter. And that, and when you have a bad punter and an okay place kicker, I'm not going to say Ricky Aguayo is bad, but he's he's certainly not great. Uh, you know, it makes everything look bad. And uh, maybe Logan Tyler can turn it around, and this is his year. But that was a really bad performance uh, on Monday night. And yeah, the punt block was just. Uh, you know, I think Willie was asked about it and said, "What well, you know." He, he's Wolverine's not not coach to just let the guy go by him like that, but they got to be coached better. And, and Willie Taggart said that that they need to be coached better, and they do um, in all phases, but special teams included. Because again, just like last year, it was a it was a train wreck. And this year, you have a full time coach devoted to that, and it still didn't look any better than it did last year. Case and Beatty says, "Miss me yet." But then Casey yeah. Beatty turn around. Didn't his, yeah. his last season actually pretty decent? Maybe so. There's there's hope for Logan yeah. Tyler. Yeah, his last season was good, and, and Lo Logan Tyler certainly has the leg. But man, he's got to cut out the line drives right down the middle of the field. Think about the punts that DJ Matthews was trying to field. They were always in the air for nine seconds, yeah. and there were three guys around him every time he tried to catch it. Meanwhile, the Virginia Tech guy, it's like he's catching a he's out the gate. He's catching a line drive where he gets to catch it on the run. I did see somebody that was criticizing dj matthews and i'm i just want to con confer with you real quick here Corey. Uh, you know live not having done this you know talked about before dj matthews had no right to return any punt right he made the right play doing the fair catch every time i think there was one he could have returned i think there was one that he had um he had maybe six yards six five or six yards between him and one of the defenders and you know i, I think that one he could have tried to return but I guess you'd rather be on the safe side than, than catch it if a guy's bearing down on you. But maybe one. And they yeah. punted a bunch, didn't they? Weren't there like eight punts? Sounds um, about right. And only one of them was one. I mean, half the more than half of them were inside his own ten. So he didn't really have a lot of chances to return one. Although I might have told him at one point, like, hey, dude, I know this guy kicks it really high, and we tell you to never catch the ball inside your own ten or inside your own five. 
But even if it's coming down at the eight and there's guys all around you, catch it and try to make somebody miss because heaven knows our offense isn't getting out of this hole. Maybe they'll maybe they'll face mask you and they'll give us an extra fifteen. But you know, other than that, I think I thought he did everything well and he caught everything. Um, so that was a plus. Yeah, that's the one thing I w- I would hope that they could actually you know uh, improve with coaching is maybe work on like gunner protection a little bit better because they. He he had three white jerseys on him. Every it wasn't just one guy. It wasn't two. It literally felt like every single time he had three guys within yeah. two yards of him. So I mean, so, it's, yeah, it's tough. It's a tough sell. And one thing to watch, and I saw it on our message board. Um, I, uh, a poster had a clip of it was one of the punts in the first half when it was fourth and one, and they decided to punt it. There's three linebackers, maybe six yards off the line of scrimmage for Florida State. The long snapper snaps it and then just bolts straight down the field. And these three linebackers don't do anything to them. Don't chip them. Don't touch them. Don't even look at them. And by the time DJ Matthews catches the ball, the long snapper is right there. Not only have the gunners gotten by uh, their guys, but the long snapper is standing there right in front of DJ Matthews, and nobody bothered to even try to block them. And I just I can't imagine why that would be um, a strategy to just let the long block the long snapper run free. I think I, I that mean, actually is though, Corey. I think usually long snappers do but, get. But what were those three linebackers doing then? I don't know. Maybe but setting in, up maybe the second level. Maybe in this instance, of... uh, and that might be true. I mean, maybe you think that okay, most long snappers it won't matter. They can't get down the field fast enough for it to make a difference. So let's worry about the other guys that we need to block and assume that DJ Matthews can get by the long snapper. It just so happened this dude could run pretty pretty well for a long snapper. Oh. And, uh, you know, the guy punted the ball where it was seven seconds in the air. So, But if the, if the long snapper hadn't have been there on a couple of those, I think DJ Matthews fields it and at least tries to make something happen. At least slow him down, maybe. I mean, at least chip him. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was a reason. Maybe they're not allowed to touch. I don't know. I don't know the rules when it comes to long snapper. But it is pretty uh, jarring to watch. Garnett76 says, I'm awake. I have a few quick questions. How do you guys feel about a rule change to make an injured player sit out until a change of possession or something longer than one play? Uh, the players walking downfield and dropping to the ground was ridiculous, not to mention really bad acting. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, that sounds good, but ultimately, you know, this is going to make kids in a very health-sensitive sport even that much more pressured into staying in games if they really are hurt that's the way this this would like line up i feel like if you're like all right if you if you get out of a game you can't come back until a change of possession well then if you're a kid and you're somewhat hurt you're going to try to stay out there and that's what this entire sport is trying to get away from if you are a little bit hurt they want you to get off the field immediately i mean they need to do something i don't know what it could be maybe the whole unsportsmanlike thing but that you know that that's, again that's going to be a very subjective call and then Who's to say if you know who's acting and who's not? But you would. Well, that's just true. I mean, it. sometimes you do get cramps, but if you get cramps and then you're back on the field in 90 seconds, um, or four more plays, you're right back on the field. Okay, well, how bad were those cramps? Were you? Yeah. How bad was that ankle? Are you really hurt? I don't know what you could do. I, I mean, I guess you could say you could stay out, but you're right. I think that would lead kids to like, you know, not want to even get checked out to just hobble back to the line, no, I'm good, no, I'm good, no, I'm good. Stay there because it's the first play of the last drive. You know, there's, it's 20 to 20 in the fourth quarter, and they're, and the team's got to go 80 yards. He doesn't want to come out of the game because he, you know, he stubbed a toe or he got a, he, he slightly sprained his ankle. So I get that, but, you know, I do think, I do think what happened, and, and it's weird that it, and maybe it hasn't taken this long. I know we talked on headlines about it, and Ira and Jeff swear that teams do this all the time. I don't remember Florida I know Florida State didn't do it to Houston at all, and they should have. But I think what happens is, man, I think maybe these defensive coaches are like, you know what? If your whole strategy is going to be, you can't, you're not going to out-scheme me. You're not going to try to game plan for me. You're just going to speed me up and get me tired. Well, get, I'm not going to let you. There's no rule in the rule book that says I can't have a guy lay down and have cramps. And that's going to slow you down. Then you're actually going to have to coach. You're actually going to have to come up with a play because I'm going to take – I'm going to have 45 seconds to get this defense set up. If your only strategy is to snap it with 33 on the clock while my guys are – you're not even giving me a chance to call a defense, well, here's what I'm going to do to combat that. And there's nothing you can do about it. Do we know if there was any communication from our coaches in the booth to Willie regarding the Nooney non-touchdown play, he asks. 
I, I we don't, don't and that's yeah. a good question. We actually should have asked Walt Bell that. Like, I, I'm genuinely curious if Walt Bell was saying, or if anybody in the booth was saying, "Hey, man, I think Challenge he got in. It. I think he got in." Challenge. I will also say this, and we we've talked about it ad nauseum, or we did that that night. I don't understand how the booth didn't, how the ACC re, what was the guy in the ACC replay booth doing? Right. Like. Like, he buzzed down for the Virginia Tech fourth down play where it was so obvious he didn't get in, the whole Virginia Tech offense started walking off the field. But he, he challenged that. I mean, they looked at that. They stopped the game to review that. Why, in a play like that, we're all live, almost the whole stadium thought he got in. Your referee calls him down at the one-inch line. Why in the world wouldn't you buzz down and say, hey, man, let me take another look at that. Give me a second especially when you saw the replay the first time, and it certainly wasn't clear-cut whether he got in or not. I, I, it boggles the mind. I, I gave Willie, I think looking back on it, I might have given Willie a bit too hard a time because he's got to assume, okay, they looked at it and they didn't see it. They, they're they supposed to look at every play, and he must have looked at it and not, and not seen anything. So why would I want to challenge this or waste time when I can rush up to the line and try to score anyway? I, I don't know. I, it just, I would love to know why that, what that guy was doing where on that specific play, he had something better to do than to buzz down and say, hey, man, that play that you said he was down four inches from the goal line, he might have gotten in, so let's hold up for a second. And I will say it's a confluence, I think, of maybe two things. I think there might have been a fear of that was a fumble, and that's actually like a bread-and-butter situation for a tempo offense. You're on the one-yard line, just snap it, you're going to get a touchdown. So I think maybe those two things factor into your mind. You're like, well, is it worth it to stop and challenge it and get six points? Or we might actually lose the ball. Or, listen, we just got to move the ball 23 inches and we're going to get a a, a touchdown. I feel pretty good about our odds. So I think that might have factored into it as well. But, again, we'll never know. The game changes, obviously, if that happens. And finally, Garnett asks, on a lighter note, Aslan, who rates higher, Ole Miss women or Florida State women? I love the show, guys. I had a talk with this uh, with one of my friends who was actually in town a few weeks ago. There's something about the Ole Miss women, their vintage, that I really appreciate, but it's a very homogenous sort of uh, thing. Florida State, they're just all flavors. They're just a little bit of everything. There's a little bit of classy. There's a little bit of edgy. There's a little bit of... And just a lot of from column A, column B, and column C that that we're, we're pretty undefeated. And all my friends are like, I just don't know if we're getting creepy and old and we're a bunch of horn dogs, but the girls there look ridiculous now. And I'm like, yeah, there's temptation everywhere. There's temptation everywhere. I, I was told, really and not that that's what this show is about, but uh, I, I can't remember if I've said this on the air or not. I, I'm on the air so much these days. I was yeah, like, it's hard I, to remember. I clearly. Um, but I am to the point now in my early, I say early 40s. I still think I could classify as early 40s. Yeah. Where I, I, legitimately they all look like uh, middle schoolers to me. <laughs> Guys and girls. These college students look like they're 12 years old. Um, so I know you're still younger than me, so it's still it's it's probably different, but uh, but it's it's just crazy. I, I noticed it when I was walking through the tailgate um, on Monday night. It's like, man, why are all these middle? It's nuts. These all these kids should be uh, you know, studying for whatever English tomorrow. I mean, it's just it's nuts how young they all look. Yeah. All right. That's a good way to say. It. I feel like I look young too, right? You for do. my age. Yeah, I would say you're like 38. I would figure just a little bit older than I am, but. You know what I think I'm going to think of, I'm actually thinking about doing and I'll say this on the air I don't care. Yeah, say getting it. a little getting a little just for men for my goatee. Oh. What would you think, think about that? I'd like to see Ira do that first. And then well, I think, I think Ira, but Ira's got the but Ira's got the hair number 1. He, true. He's, he's a silver fox almost. Um and it looks uh, regal with him. But I feel like with me my my whole bottom of my goatee is is gray now. And that's the only hair I have on my face or on my head anywhere above my chest so and i shaved my chest so really it's the only hair i have on my body so i i I feel like maybe i should go with the brown little coloring for just for men and just see what that looks like it might make me look like i'm 22 again i'm trying to see how it would look i i think it's going to be jarring but i think ultimately might be the right play do it do it Corey. i'm going to try it what's the worst thing i'll just shave it off if it looks ridiculous um but you know, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna try it. Stephanie seems kind of on board with it, just to see what it looks like. She likes. She said she likes the way it looks, which is the right answer. But just to see what it looks like, uh, she said, "Yeah, go ahead. We'll see. We'll see how it works." All right, more men's oh, yeah. grooming tips 
and your Real question. Quick, though, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry Aslan. No, you're fine. My fault. My fault. But no, I'm no. sure we have people listening to this that have used just for men or a similar hair care product. Mm -hmm. Let us know in the next Renegade Express how it went for you and if I should give it a try. All right. I, please, please do so, folks. I'm probably gonna have to eventually use that as well if I don't lose all my hair, losing the battle. Somebody said something on the board channel report. Like I know. No, there's probably not a lot of you guys hanging around, but somebody help out Aslan with his hair sticking up. It looks ridiculous. And I'm like, well, it's, it's actually the optical illusion to try to create the fact that maybe I do have hair, but I really right. don't. Smart, so that smart, hurt. good play. That hurt. All right, let's step aside. We'll come back. We'll plow through the remainder of these questions of the Renegade Express right here on Wake Up War Chant. Coming right back after this. You're listening to Wake Up War Chant Low Car Beer for the Seminole Soul. Back to Aslan and Corey. You can feel it. Wake up! Welcome back, folks. He's Cora Maz on his Wake Up Board Chant. We're doing the Renegade Express. We got a bunch of questions, so I think we're going to do the calls. We'll save those for Friday, and I'm sure Gene Williams will probably give us another menu of over-under items that we can attack. Corey's clearly in the lead on that one. I think he, I don't know, he went like five of one. I was like one of five. I did, I did a very poor job. But what's 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 new? All right, Chiefs T99 says, can you ask Willie why were we doing our scripted walkthrough for our first series in the parking lot of the Four Points Hotel on Tennessee Street? We had people taking video that could have possibly been shared with Virginia Tech, and something should be learned from this, especially when we paid so much money for an indoor practice facility. I will say this, according to the esteemed five-star Irish Chauffeur, uh, Jimbo Fisher's done the same, does the same thing, did the same thing. They would have their walkthroughs in the parking lot the day of the game. Yeah, I'm surprised they don't do it in a ballroom. I'm I'm not too bothered by it. I think it just it just piles on to the loss, the way it looked. It's just another one of those things, the jerseys, the music. There's video of them practicing in a parking lot. It just makes it feel that much worse. I mean, I don't think that helped Virginia Tech at, at all. I, I don't, but, but that, I don't, that is what they've done in the past. So it's not like this was a Willie Taggart It wasn't idea. a rookie move. Yeah, it wasn't it a, wasn't rookie, a rookie, move. rookie move, but, you know, maybe – Maybe you have snipers trained on all the windows above the uh, above the parking lot next time, especially for Sanford. You don't want them to know what you're going to do. Right, or do like reverse tinted windows where like everybody's room cannot look outside. That way you can practice in peace. Because, yeah, it was just some oh, Virginia like, Tech yeah, like fan. An like an interrogation room almost. Exactly. Yeah, it was just some random Virginia Tech fan who stayed at that hotel and was like, hey, looky here, check it out. But, yeah, everybody's tweeted you and I and Ira about this. What about this? Look at the video. I'm like, what, what do you want me to do? What are we going to do? All right, How Max, would you think about it real quick? But yeah. If you were, not you, but I'm talking to a fan. If you were staying in a in South Bend and you saw the Notre Dame team do, running through a walkthrough and you recorded it, what would be the next step that you would take? Send it to us and then ask us to send it to the coaching staff. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that, so you might want to think of something. You might, I guess. Uh, you might want to think of another. But how would they have even gotten it to Fuente? You just give it to one and of the you, coaches. It's on your cell phone. Text to somebody. It's easy. It's it, technology, brother. But if you did do it, why then would you broadcast it? Why wouldn't you just keep it on the DL? Like if you did send it to Fuente and Foster and say, "Look, man, I think we got. I think we know what their first few plays are going to be. Look out! Look what they're doing in the parking lot." You know, I, I just you know, just don't think that 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 really made much of a difference in the uh, outcome of the game, even yeah. if they somehow got it to the Virginia Tech coaches. Maxwell Gibbs. Sup, gents. Gibby here. Never saw you, by the way. Still waiting for my tequila shots, Maxwell. Uh, his takeaway, he says, from what I witnessed Monday, is I really hope that Willie does not become another Charlie Armstrong, Gene Chiswick, or Will Muschamp. These were guys who all were great recruiters but could not win big at elite programs. Yes, Chiswick won a title, but put an asterisk next to that one since it was Scam Newton. He spelled it with the dollar sign in front of the C. Scam Newton. Mm, I see. I see. I know it was only one game, but man, the play calling and in-game adjustments were just all caps awful. Do you think that maybe the moment was too big for Willie and he had too many nerves? Still can't understand why you would use a small guy like Nooney to block for your mismatch tight end. Ira said it in his three two one, which if you become a member of Warchant.com is probably one of the best bits of content you'll get as a subscriber. Use the promo code Warchant thirty. One I, I of the one of the best. One of the, yeah, not, yeah. not the best. I think it's the best. Sorry. I know you said that last week. It didn't hurt my feelings at all. Um I'm gonna come out with a four three two one next week. <laughs> four and out. <laughs> I think he said something about Willie maybe was expecting the best and not preparing for the worst. 
I don't I don't think it was like the nerves got the the best of him, but like that game just felt ridiculous. The beginning of it in a good way. It was just like wow, this is different. Like everybody in this stadium right now is engaged and invested and there's just no way they're going to lose this game. I remember they showed Willie in the tunnel getting ready to come out, lead the team, and he's just grinning from ear to ear and it's like this is my moment. I've dreamt this my whole life. I'm here. It's happening. And then boom. I mean, I, I don't think it was nerves. I don't think that the moment was too big. But I think it's maybe to Iris' point that he said, uh, maybe it's just one of those things where you just felt like, you know, that everything's in our favor. It's got to work. It's got to work. And then you, you kind of get punched in the mouth. And it's like, uh oh, um, I wasn't expecting this. But I don't think it was nerves. But maybe that, in a sense, is nerves. I don't know. Yeah, man. It, it could be. Could have been. I mean, it's hard to know. But he needs to get over it quick. Whatever, whatever it was. I mean, the in-game adjustments, the, I mean, just the, the bizarre fact that, the, I mean, you go into the half, you're like, all right, you get the ball coming out of the half, they'll be all right, they'll figure something out, but to, to come out in the third quarter and it just, your defense keeps fighting with every, you know, bone in their body to keep that a game, and you just can't get anything going, that was, I, I did, that was, that was crazy, but, um, you know, I, I, hopefully Samford won't pr- uh, provide as much, uh, you know, resistance, and they'll figure things out, and then it'll be smooth sailing from here. But no, I'm not ready to. I mean, I, I mean, if this doesn't work, I mean, maybe we'll look at the Virginia Tech game two and a half years, three years from now, and be like, we should have seen it coming. But I, I feel it's almost silly right now to to sound alarms and, and, and get you know and and start you know running the red flag up. I just I I don't want to be that guy. I'd rather be wrong and wait than you know jump on you know his back and start being like he's going to be a I mean, bust it just seems crazy it's just it's i think it's just the context man and we'll say it a lot this season you know that that the and i and i'm going to keep bringing it up but jimbo first fisher's first real game they were down 44 to 7 and they were ranked 12th in the country they were down 44 to 7 in oklahoma they gave up i looked it up because we talked about it on headlines today they gave up four touchdowns on the first four drives of that game they gave up 34 points and 380 yards in the first half of that game and if Oklahoma hadn't have pulled off, you know, stepped off the gas because Mark Stoops was the defensive coordinator, they might have put up 70 or 80 points. They were completely overwhelmed. And, but then you have to remember, okay, well, that 2000, it's not really fair to judge Mark Stoops by that, that game because he took over a defense that was statistically the worst in Florida State history in 2009. Well, you know what? Willie Taggart took over an offense that was statistically one of the worst in Florida State history last year. That offense was a train wreck. And it's going to be a while, apparently. We know they have skill positions, and I think they will be better at the end of this season than they were last season. I just think they will. But it is what he took over. There is context. It, it does matter. That offense last year was awful. And maybe we were expecting too much change too quickly, just like we did with Mark Stoops in 2010. Maybe there's only so much Greg Fry and Willie Taggart and Walt Bell can do with this group that's young uh, and inexperienced at the skill positions, and then not all that great up front. Noel Holla comes back with another question. Will wake up or chant air in the morning, or are you guys still morning? I don't. That's like repetitive. Yeah, the show will be up first thing in the morning every day. That's the plan. That's how we're going to do it. That's your clarification. Good. That's good. That makes sense. Heisman twenty. Do you think we still lose this game with the previous coaching staff? I think we do. We would have scored in the red zone, but we may not have gotten there because Foster would have killed us taking 40 seconds to snap a ball and our defense would have given up 40 plus points. The main thing this coaching staff messed up was not thrown to the Giants a wide receiver, which I hope is fixed along with running LeBourne until I get tired. I don't want to go down this road. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I, I think that, I mean, I, if I'm being honest, I think they would have scored more than three points. I don't know if they win the game. Um, I, I just don't know. And I can say I think they would have scored more than three points, but what was it, Jimbo Fisher's second-to-last game, ACC game as a head coach? He scored exactly three points. So, And that was with 10 years in the offense, 10 years at Florida State, not 10 months. So I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to answer. Noel Biz, wake up! I think I was yelling that from the stands all game on Labor Night. Ooh. Have a few over unders for you guys now that we have seen one game. Maybe we should save this for tomorrow. There's like seven over under projections. Uh, well, let's see. He's got he's got the serious ones and the fun ones. Maybe we'll save the fun ones for tomorrow. Uh, anyway, he says Cam Akers over under seventeen and a half rushing attempts per game. 
He had 14 against Virginia Tech. Under, because I think uh, they're going to give the other guy some more carries now. LeBourne, I, I think LeBourne should be over zero. <laughs> Good point. Francois over under 60% completion this season. He was 62.9 against Tech. Over. Agreed. Brian Burns over under 12 sacks. He had one and a half on Monday. That's a good number. It's a good number. That's a good number. I'll say over, but I'm not confident in that at all. If he stays healthy, I'm staying. I'm saying the over. He looked good, man. He he made some really not. I mean, I, we all knew what he would done, but he was one of the guys that we talked up in the preseason that was dominating. That had some really impressive moments in that game, even ones that didn't turn out to be statistics. He still pressured the quarterback and and was in his face a good bit. Um, I was going to take the under, but you just convinced me. All right, I'll take over. And then over and under, five and a half ACC wins. Seven more, eight if you want to count Notre Dame. But we don't count Notre Dame on this program as an ACC program, do we, Corey? We don't, no. Okay. Not until they join the conference like a big boy. Yeah, so seven. They have seven more ACC games, five and a half over under, five under. and a half total. Ugh. Gosh, yeah, I know. Hurts. I just said that hurts. That they're not going to lose again, but I'm not sure how confident I am in that prediction because I just think I just admitted that I think they're going to lose at least two more ACC games. I mean, they have to go at Louisville, at Miami, at NC State. Oh, all those are losable. They might be yeah. underdogs in all those games. Yeah. Um, I, you know that it's it's like I wrote after that game. I just think Monday night lowered the ceiling for what this season can be. Yeah. I don't think it does anything to the overall direction of the program or what Willie Taggart's tenure can be here. But this is going to be – this looks like it could be a rough one. Yeah. It just does. It looks like it could be a rough – it could be a rough season. But that's just one game. Ask me after Syracuse. Yeah. Hey, look how rough it was in Athens in 2016 or in Gainesville in 2005 or Tuscaloosa in 2007. Those things turn yeah. around pretty quickly. Yeah, I think what it is is that Jimbo, you know, according to the rankings, had recruited so well that people thought, oh, man, this is going to be easy to turn around. And that would maybe be me. it's just, yeah, right. But it's just, again, last year was a 7 and 6 team, really close to win it, to being like a 5 and 7 team uh, and not making a bowl. I mean, they, you know, they barely beat Syracuse. They had to have a missed field goal to beat Syracuse. Um, and they had the Wake and Duke games. They were not. They were close to being a four-win team last year. They were not good at all. Yeah, they could so, have been a nine-win team if they don't fumble against Louisville and Tavares McFadden turns around against Miami too. I mean, well, kind true, of, that could always happen. But you know, you could, all, and that's the beauty of Florida State is every game so close. You never know a few plays here and there. But the point is, they weren't. It's not like he took over a team that had proven it's immensely talented. Right. It proved that it was a three and five. It was a three and five ACC team last year, man. They're they're a by all accounts in tw again twenty one ACC games. Their last twenty one, they're ten and eleven. That's the pure definition of mediocrity. <sighs> Bimini so, bound. Let's go. Sorry, next question. didn't mean. Didn't mean to uh, go ahead. No, you, you can wrap it up, Corey. I'm sorry. I did. I did. I, I'm just going to keep reiterating ten and eleven. Ten and eleven. <sighs> Bimini Bound. So now that we lost to Virginia Tech, is there anything that this game, Samford, uh, that this week can really do to give you confidence? If we beat them 70-0, to zero, will it make a difference or not until we face quality competition? Yeah, I mean, if they come out and win 56-7, I'll, I'll feel really good. I'll feel a lot better than if they win 31-17. I, I mean, I will. I just will. If this yeah, offense can, can roll, if this, if this offense can get three or four scoring drives, where it's peak efficiency in running up tempo, I'll feel really good. If there's only one of those, if a whole bunch of touchdowns are coming off short field because the defense is getting you know turnovers or DJ Matthews is busting off punt returns, yeah, I'll still be a little bit nervous about the offense. I mean, I'm probably going to be nervous about the offense until they actually play, you know, actually shoot maybe at Syracuse, but um, I mean, which is not that far away. But yeah, I mean, they can do they can do something Saturday to to really inject some life back into the fan base or at least me yeah i just i think that's all again it's when we talk about ceilings that's another ceiling i, I think there's only so much they could do even if they put up a hundred uh that, that would mean anything you want you just want to see them play better you want to see them like actually kick extra points and play the fight song after touchdowns but i you know it's samford so and, and quite frankly you know it's on on four days rest or you know, four days rest so um, I don't expect them to come out and look great. If they do, I think that's a good sign because it shows that they focused up 
and they were able to uh, you know take the week seriously and bounce back. But as far as execution and the speed of the offense, and I just won't I won't take anything that seriously until you know until Syracuse. I mean, I know that it's Syracuse and Northern Illinois. That's not great shakes, but those two are more those two are legitimate teams, uh, and that that's when we'll I'll, I'll I'll know if I'll feel better about this offense. Yeah, I mean, play, listen, at Syracuse now has become a very interesting game, right? Sure. It's become a very interesting game. So I think there's a lot to gauge when that happens. We just had again, two more. Again, remember, they beat Syracuse. They played Syracuse last year at home and had to beat them on a, a missed field goal. Yep. So what makes us think that going up there and playing an experienced quarterback, and I think Dungy was kind of hurt in that game or something, right? Like he had an ankle problem. So. He couldn't run real well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he ran for over 200 yards in the first game so he can run. He wasn't able to really do that against Florida State. I mean, there's reason to be – I mean, last year's team barely beat that Syracuse team. These are the same players. So just, you know, take that for what it's worth. We've had two more questions drop in the box. We're going to try to wrap this up. I think we have about four more now total. Harley07 says, hey, guys, love the show. Thanks for the late night effort on Monday after the game. Everybody keeps pointing to the offensive line, but here's a thought. Was recruiting good, but strength and conditioning poor? Also, what happened to Levante Taylor on the first drive? Uh, he got abused. He just looked awful. I think that oh, could be a nerves thing. I mean, maybe he was too hyped because I feel like he calmed down later. I mean, later in the game, he didn't. He wasn't. As, he wasn't getting picked on. He wasn't as suspect. Yeah, but they were going after him, and he also gave up a third down down the sideline when Virginia Tech it felt like they were deep in their oh, own end. Oh gosh, and they threw, threw off their back foot. It was oh yeah. yeah, and he just let the guy go over him and catch it. I mean, that stuff can't happen. They're going to be doing that a lot now. They're going to watch film, um, so he needs to nip that in the bud. He was good at it last year. He's a small dude. Um, going up against big dudes, but he's proven that he can compete with them and knock the ball away. He just, for whatever reason, on that touchdown, it just you know is McFadden esque. Not to be rude, but it was, and he's too good a player to look like that. So I, yeah, maybe it was nerves, um, over aggressiveness. I think trust your fundamentals, trust your keys. Don't go out there and just try to you know be a dog too much. Yeah, sure, all that stuff. Just you know, go make plays. Uh, and the question, uh, recruiting good but strength and conditioning poor, possibly for the O line. I don't think that, that they weren't they weren't getting manhandled. It wasn't like they were getting decleated. I mean, there was one play where Jawan Williams got pretty beat off the edge, but that wasn't a strength and conditioning thing. That was it seemed like probably bad technique. Listen, that 2016 class that was much ballyhooed, uh, just potentially could be very overrated. I mean, that's that's a very clear and distinct possibility. Um, I, I would I would probably lean more towards maybe the guys just didn't project as well as major Division One offensive linemen rather than being too weak or, or poorly conditioned. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the jury's still out, really, on those guys, I think. Um, even though it's their third year in the system, uh, you know, I, I, I still think there's they got they certainly have plenty to prove, but they also have some time to do it. But it, it has to start now. Um, and we'll we'll see, man. We'll we'll see in the middle of this season what what this what though that class really is. We'll certainly have enough proof and evidence by the middle of this season to know what in the world that class was about. Because right now, yes, it certainly hasn't lived up to that billing at all. I mean, again, Virginia Tech had the third most tackles for loss in the country this past weekend. That's embarrassing. In case you don't remember, Landon Dickerson was a four-star. Jawan Williams was a four-star. Mike Arnold was a four-star. Josh Ball was a four-star, but he's no longer with the program. Babyon Johnson was a four-star, but uh, is clearly behind Al Garbley, who's entrenched. Uh, four-star. And then Andrew Baselli, three-star, who's no longer with the program. So two of those guys aren't even here anymore. Imagine if yep, Josh it. Ball would have, you know, just, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm not going to get too much in that, but if he was available that probably changes a, a decent amount. Yeah, maybe. But anyway. All right, next question comes from Doke FSU. Good. Uh, actually, Doke FSU 1, I apologize. Not to be confused with Doke FSU. This is Doke FSU 1, Corey. Uh, it starts off with good morning, Knoll Nation. There's about 17 O's in there. Hopefully I got all of them in. Question, when looking back at the game, do you consider the missed field goal to be the turning point of the game? You make that field goal and they overturn the touchdown catch. I really believe that changes the outcome of the game. Do you agree? Also, would you think this week the team and staff need to run up the score to get respect back uh, from the media and the fans? 
Oh, let's go back. No. There wasn't, or you go, you start off. Where do you want to start uh, off? There, there's nothing you could do against Sanford that would get respect back from the media and the fans. Literally nothing. It's all, it's an FCS team. Nothing from that the media. should take them lightly. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing. Maybe, the, even me, the, maybe fans. the fans. I think some of the fans would feel good. You walk out of Doak winning, you know, 55 to three. I think they'll feel, I think they'll feel good. They'll get some respect for your offensive prowess. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I maybe. Um, but what was the first question? Uh, the turning point of the game, do you consider it the missed field goal? Was there a no. turning point to the game? I don't feel like there was a turning point because they were in that game for so long. Uh, but, I mean, if uh, anything, I would say maybe Gavin's dropping that. Gavin's dropping the, the the ball in the back of the end zone. He catches that. I think what, it would have been 10-7 to 7 at that point, or maybe it would have been 7-7. Seven, seven. I don't even remember how the scoring worked out, but that was 7-7. Seven seven. I, no, I think they were uh, – yeah, I, I think – I can't remember. That's a good question. I would say um, no. It, they were down ten nothing, so that would have made it ten to seven. And then I think the missed field goal came right after that, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean those two plays were critical. I would say the the Gavin drop and uh, the Nooney non-review were the two. I, I just think if they had a touchdown, if they got one touchdown, I just I would have loved to see what that did to Virginia Tech. Yeah. If they started to press. Um, because that, that offense wasn't very good and didn't do much all night. Didn't do anything all night, really, after the first drive. So what would have happened? But, you know, I, yeah, I don't know if there was a turning point. It, it certainly doesn't help when – I mean, heck, you could say the turning point is when you have the you have the stadium as loud as it's ever been before a pregame, at least in a, a good long while before the post Jameis. And uh, you, let the, you let the offense go right down the field in 10 plays where they don't even face a third down. That could be one. All right. Noel Dad eighty four. Um, it looks like either in Arabic or, or Farsi he puts wake up. I don't know. I think he's maybe maybe it's my my people's language or or Arabic. I don't know. But anyhow, he says wake up, gentlemen. This is more of a comment than anything else. Yes, that loss of Virginia Tech sucked, but you know what else sucked? Losing to USF at home in Doak. I was there getting my uh, Master's of Science degree and remember vividly how people wanted a blackout to protest Bobby's downfall. Listening and reading to some people calling for our coach's resignation after one bad game is asinine. Get a grip, people. We will be okay. Thanks for keeping it light and keeping us laughing, especially all those Noel fans on Suicide Watch this week. Yeah, there's well, been some bad times. Part. There's been some bad times in the last 15 years. It hasn't been all Hasn't been all uh, rainbows and lollipops to Florida State fans. It news. is crazy, man. It, it, but it is going to his point. It is crazy how anyone could watch one game and say, "Yep, nope, this was a terrible hire. He's terrible. We can't. He, he can't win here. No chance. What a drastic error this was. We're screwed for the next three years." Because it look, it might end up being the truth, but obviously, one game isn't nearly enough sample size to make declarations like that. It's just like how do these people go through life? Like, it boggles. Oh, that light's never going to turn. This light's never going to turn green. I just got to go. I got to go. I've been here for nine seconds. This thing. What, what, what's? I mean, how do you live through? You just. I, it's it's really really hard to fathom having that mentality. Just you know, and I'm probably too laid back. I'm too even keel. But never in my wildest dreams would I watch one game and say, "Yep, this is a wrap. This guy can't do it." This was a horrible, horrible mistake. Yeah, well, yeah. There's a, there are people who say that stuff, right? Like when when Florida State lost to North Carolina in 2001, that should have been it for Bobby. Like, come on, come on. Like we're we're not even a full year removed from playing in a national title game, but that was it. Get rid of him then and then. But well, I mean, again, you know, say there's so many examples. Yeah. Saban, Louisiana Monroe. Uh, but this is the know. first game, so that kind of is different. I mean, I mean, Kirby won his opener. I mean, obviously, they, I don't think he played a conference opponent that was ranked. I mean, I don't think Saban did but, either. I mean, so, J J so if you had to flip these games, Jimbo lost his first real game by 30 points. He was down by 37 points in the fourth quarter. But his team looked like wilderness. they hadn't practiced. We were terrible. Florida State was terrible for so long going to that game. And listen, I was I was dejected. I was broken apart at a, at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Bozeman, Montana. I was like, this is never going to happen again. We're never going to be good again. This is what life is going to be. Listen, I was broken up about it. I totally was. But I think to a certain degree, it's, I don't know, maybe 2013 doesn't feel as far away from some people as, as we might like to think it is. That, that That's what makes this that much more jarring. I mean, the, the 2010 team was coming off a 7-6 and six season. Yeah. The 2018 team is coming off a 7-6 and six season. They're very similar. I mean, they really are very similar. I just think Florida State has more talent on its current roster than Jimbo inherited. But Jimbo also had the uh, 
the advantage of having been there the three previous years. So he knew what needed to be fixed immediately and did a very good job on it of it. And by the end of the year, they were a legitimate top 15, top 20 type program. Although the next year they struggled again. And I would have loved to see the message boards and Twitter in 2011 after that Wake Forest loss. Yeah. I mean, also, Jimbo people, had a better quarterback in 2010. I mean, you could argue that Christian lot. Ponder yeah, was probably a little bit better along. Than, and his own quarterback, a quarterback he got for his offense yeah. to run his offense. Well, no, Ponder was already there. Right. But Ponder had been running his offense for three years. And then the guy that came in after him, he was recruited specifically to run Jimbo's offense and who obviously played some in, in 10 as well. But, you know, after, after they lost that game to Wake Forest in 2011, I, I've mentioned this before, but I think Jimbo was like – his record was like 12-8. and eight. And two of those wins were against FCS teams, and they had just lost to Wake Forest for a third straight loss in 2011 after being ranked in the top ten to start the country. Florida State fans were through with them. Many of them were like, this guy's been a train wreck. You might have been that guy. Like this guy, he just lost to Wake Forest on the road. Wake Forest, we're, gonna, we're back to the days of losing to Wake Forest. And so the next 50 games, they went 46-4. and four. Like, so give it time. It's just – that's what I don't understand. Florida State fans just lived with – went through this. Get, in three years, and two years, if Willie Taggart's still bum-fuzzling bum around and, and <laughs> good, good losing recovery. by 21 points I, – I caught myself there um, – and, and losing by 21 points and looking like they're not coached on offense, I get it, man. But it's one game. You've just lived through this. I, it, that's what – I just – I know I'm – I know fandom by nature is irrational – but that's really hard. You can, A team can be poorly coached. It doesn't mean the guy can't coach. Jimbo had plenty of games where Florida State was poorly coached. Nobody would say Jimbo was a bad coach. But there were games where he was bad. La Monday night, Willie Taggart was awful. That certainly doesn't mean Willie Taggart is going to be an awful head coach for Florida State. Yeah. Or he could be. Who knows? Real quick story, and then we got to get to the last question. Uh, Holy to that, moly, I really have to pee. Well, to that point, I actually, I, my, I opened my my second laptop, and it was on the thread from Sunday night when they had the announcement about the uh, unconquered campaign, and that Willie had donated a million dollars. And this one guy, like, it was it was pulled up as soon as I opened up my laptop. It went right to that thread, and it was. How can you not love this guy? Everything about him, I'm all in. He loves us. I love him. I'm so excited he's our head coach. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I wonder what he was saying on Monday night when this was all going south. So I clicked on his profile, and you could see all the posts he made. And literally the very next thread that he or post that he made was Monday night at like 8.27 p.m., and it was just, what the hell are they doing out there? This is horrible. And it's like, oh, man, yep, that's... That's how this all works. That's fandom, buddy. We've yeah. said it the whole time, man. It's all great. He's done awesome in almost everything off the field. If you don't win, it doesn't matter. But it's also just, you know, maybe fans have always – I guess fans have always been like this. It's just now we're, we're subjected to it more because of our jobs and also just the nature of society and the easy access we have to so many different people's opinions. But, man, it's got to be it's got to be really hard to live life like that. Yeah. Just, oh, God, it's over. There's no chance. What, this, what, is, what, is, what was Wilcox thinking? This was the guy – this is the best guy for the job? This is ridiculous. It's like, man, you were say, you, if you had any brains, you were pro if, you, if you thought like this eight years ago, you were saying the exact same things about Jimbo Fisher. And when he proved you wrong, you would have thought you'd have learned your lesson then. But, nope, you're right back at it one game into this guy's tenure. All right, back to the bladder bus. Last one. Here we go. Conway T4811. Hello, War Chant Media Men. My wife, Sarah, has a couple of questions for you guys. What's up, Sarah? You can have your own account, you know. But anyhow, uh, what is your opinion on how or what Willie Taggart should do as far as adjustments go? There's three questions. That's the first one. I would like to see more, perhaps, reliance on uh, the eyes in the sky, maybe calling some plays. Um, I would like to see a shorter bench. I don't want to see seven guys re rotating at wide receiver. Pick three, four, go with them. And I think if Landon Dickerson does come back in the next few weeks, maybe move him back to guard, see if Derek Kelly and Jawan Williams can hold the fort down at tackle. Okay, those were, all, uh, those were all very good recommendations, Aslan. I agree with you. I would like to see more dancing. Um, I think that's number one. I'd like the DJ to play more. Um, no, I, I'm just, obviously black uniforms all the time until you start winning with them just to reverse the jinx. And then other than that, I think everything's fine. Oh, my gosh. This is such a long show. Uh, why exactly? It's ridiculous. Sorry. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I've had to pee for 35. <laughs> 
we don't have a radio anymore, and we've done our longest ever show. <laughs> oh, gosh. Why exactly do you think these kids want to play so hard for Willie? It's admirable. Uh, they can relate to him. I mean, a lot of these guys are young African-American men, and uh, the journey that Willie has done in his life, I think there's there's parallels, and there's just something different about it. Just imagine being in a different country, and you finally see somebody who speaks English. You're like, oh, man, my man, how you been? I, I think to a certain degree that's what it is. At least that's what, what some of the players have told us when we've asked them that. Um, it is admirable. Hopefully they'll play a little more disciplined and, and less sloppy. And also, Corey, I think it, I think he's fun to play for. No. But I think he's fun to play for if you're winning. And so they would like to continue to have fun. And to do that, you need to win. I do think they'll play hard because I think they, th I think they think he really cares about them and wants them to succeed in life. And the most important question that we've been asked all week, Corey: Who's better, Batman or Superman? I mean, Superman, right? Because he's uh, he doesn't have toys. Like he's just a, I mean, he, he's invincible unless you got some kryptonite, and Batman ain't got no kryptonite. Um, as far as a better character, ba I guess Batman's kind of more of a, you know, a playboy, right? Yeah, he goes so out and does Batman his thing. doesn't have any superpowers, so he's really not a superhero. But I've, I'm, I'm more of a Batman guy than Superman, just because I'd like to be well dressed and have a big house and a butler and a really cool car. And you, you you're dating international models all the time. You're incredibly wealthy. Clark Kent was a reporter, man. I know what they make. I am one. That ain't no life. I know he's got his, you know, snow snow house or whatever, but uh, it made of ice or whatever the heck that thing was called. But he also lived in the – he grew up in the Midwest. And, and not that anything's wrong with the Midwest, but it looked like he grew up on a farm in a small town called Smallville, I think. So, so meanwhile, my man grew up in New York City, was an international playboy, had this huge fortune. I mean, that gets all these cool toys to play with. In a fight, obviously, Superman wins. But as, a, as the question's like, who would you rather be? Uh, or who's the cooler basis. character? Yeah, it's yeah. Batman all day. All right, hey, I think we might have missed kickoff. Let's go to the stadium. We Holy moly. Is it, is it time for the Miami game yet? Thanks for listening, everybody. He's Corey Maslon. It's Wake Up Board Chat.